This is the iPhone 15, what Apple calls as new camera, new design, new phoria, and yeah, I had to actually search the term on the Urban Dictionary. It means the feeling of happiness or excitement about something newly acquired, and listen, I know the word on the street is that nothing on this phone is really new, but I don't really agree. Sure, it borrows a lot from the 14 and 13, at least in visuals, but since it brings most of the 14 Pro to a broader market, I'd say this phone is dramatically better. I'm Jaime Rivera with Pocket Now, and let me explain to you why in our full review. I think the best way to start is by clarifying that even if I could have bundled this review with the iPhone 15 Plus, I won't. I learned pretty easily last year that they target a different audience, so today I'm gonna be all about the base model. I could sit here and tell you that this is the best iPhone for most people, but in a lot of ways, I think it's actually more. It's the entry point into the latest things an iPhone can do, sure, but this variant in particular solves a major pain point, and it's that not everyone wants a big phone. It's even hard to compare this variant to any Android phone because I know of only one or two small options left. You'd think that's because most people want larger phones, but the reality is that pulling off a good small phone is harder the more powerful they get, while battery technology just does not shrink. Sure, it looks a lot like last year's iPhone, but boy, do I like this more. Apple's decision to curve the back has made it more ergonomic, sure, but then the combination with this color-infused glass makes it feel so much better. And then just look at this matte black, it looks so good. It almost reminds me of the aluminum iPhone 7 Plus that we all praised. The result is a phone that looks more elegant, spares you the fingerprints and smudges, and feels so light and easy to hold that it's almost like if it had a protective film on it. Also, since repairability has been dramatically improved, I feel far more comfortable using it without protection, though, yeah, I won't deny, I always get Apple Care Plus. When it comes to internals, though, I think the best way to see this phone is as a lighter iPhone 14 Pro. I'm actually liking this idea of Pro features making it to the base model the following year for less money. We're talking A16 Bionic, which is still faster than every other chip out there, except the 7. Pro, of course. Other essentials that you should care about are that it starts at a good amount of RAM and storage, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.3, all flavors of 5G depending on your region, a decent battery, and Apple's second generation UWB chip, which helps you find friends even in a crowd. Maybe my favorite change is USB-C, and I know this took a while, but it's finally here, and the phone comes with a pretty nifty braided cable in the box. I know some have criticized the USB 2 transfer speeds, but trust me, iPhone users have AirDrop. They don't really care. The display is also another one of those examples. I mean, Apple Super Retina XDR continues to be my favorite when it comes to color accuracy, viewing angles, and put simply, the fact that it's flat and well protected by ceramic shield. Peak brightness also doubled at 2000 nits, and it shows in rough and sunny scenarios. Any of you who care about high refresh rate should consider going 15 Pro or Pro Max, but 60 Hertz is perfectly fine for most people and pretty fluid it in day-to-day -day use. For essentials like content consumption and social media, the combination of this panel with its dual firing speakers is fantastic. As reliable as it should be. And listen, sure, I do wish there were more. Now, obviously new is that this iPhone now has the dynamic island, which can be pretty convenient with certain applications. Uber, United, and others are just some of the few that take good advantage of keeping you informed through it. Now, iOS 17 has also served to add a bit more character to a lot of the trends that started last year. I can't remember the last time that I cared about updating contact cards, but these new options to personalize them have been pretty slick. I've also praised Apple for its approach to widgets on the home screen, and the ability to now go directly to each item within only makes them more useful. Also, yeah, the moment the beta went public, you bet I got me a MagSafe stand from Spigen to try standby out, and I'm not gonna lie, it is pretty cool. 
Message transcriptions is another of my favorites since I can't always listen to voice messages and I hate that services like Telegram make you pay to be able to read them. I know messages got a bit more streamlined with this update, which is good, but I'm not really a fan of the extra command at the left to reach those controls, though the good thing is that the right command switches to the last one you used at least. Now, recording video messages through FaceTime is also pretty cool, but I think this along with name drop proves a lot of what this update is about. It's meant to provide other forms of communication, but yes, notice that it's for other iOS users. If you thought iMessage was a lock-in before, trust me, iOS 17 multiplies that by 10. But then again, Android really needs to stop fumbling with launching FaceTime competitors it kills quickly, like Hangouts, for example, and seriously, just stop the campaigns and figure things out. The result has been a pretty positive experience using this iPhone 15 over the last few weeks. Battery life has been pretty solid, giving me a full day of moderate use. Phone calls have also proven to be just as good as data connectivity over AT&T's 5G network in New York City. I mean, I can't really say that I've spent any moment where I wish that I was carrying another phone, and that states a lot about how good this device has become. And listen, the best example of that is with the cameras. The one thing that deferred me from using base iPhones before was having just two of them, but the changes this year are dramatic. Apple has made some great improvements in specifications in order to provide three focal lengths, better zoom options, and then pretty much most of the camera features you had last year with the iPhone 14 Pro, and then some new ones like capturing depth information to turn most photos into portraits later. Now, when it comes to results, yes, I took all of these photos with Apple's rich capture contrast profile given the added character they provide, though I do notice improvements in harsher light scenarios, so I even recommend those more now. The result is a color palette that does justice to New York City with great results during the day and color and a subtle drop in saturation that at least I prefer in my photos. Apple is then also the only company that I know of that cares about color not varying regardless of the focal length you pick, with the ultra wide being just as good as the primary and then the 2x optical crop, though yeah, I wouldn't push the 10x even if it's there. I also notice improvements in low light with faster photos using night mode and the advantage that they're not overdone. I feel a lot of companies overblow the results for bragging rights while iPhones are more consistent to what the eye can see, even if, sure, I wish there was a button to trigger night mode at my disposal instead of depending on the system determining that it should be available. Since depth information is captured by default in most photos, at least when you see the icon, selfies and portraits are great because I've been able to rescue certain portraits that weren't focused where I wanted them to with great results and skin tones and separation. Actually, if you've ever noticed all the base photos on my Instagram feed for reels, those are actually taken all with iPhone portraits. And then the main reason I'll always recommend iPhones is video. There's seriously no room for comparison between this and any Android phone when it comes to color, dynamic range, stabilization, and how well the phone adapts to different scenarios. And I think it still has to do with the codec. I mean, there's less warping. The quality is just so much better. Also, since this is a 14 Pro in essence, action mode is also present here as an option from the primary cameras. Now, even if you were to switch to selfie video, which I use a lot for my Apple Watch Series 9 review, this is really not just about the fact that it can do 4K at 60, but the fact that it looks just as good from the front than from the primary cameras, even for my creative work, which is the reason I trust this as my B camera. To conclude, I think it's important to look at the bigger picture of why this phone exists. This is not Apple's flagship, but the company doesn't really make mid-rangers either. There's never been an iPhone made of cheap materials, lackluster displays, or mediocre cameras to meet a certain price point, if you've noticed. That's why it's really hard to sit here and argue with the $799 price tag, because any one price mind that can just pick from any of the older iPhones or even the SE and still get quality, it's just a couple 
couple of years old. And listen, I could sit here and draw all the comparisons you want against Android and specs for the price, but the reality is that a lot of people, especially the younger demographic, really doesn't care. It's a free market where you can pick whatever you want, and yet what I see on the streets mostly is iPhones, regardless of how much better the internals are on a OnePlus 11 for $100 less. I'm not really sure what it is that Apple does to drive that level of loyalty, but if anything, I'd say that what Android OEM should copy is that. And listen, we read your comments. It's not that we hold Apple to a different standard. It's that without that level of brand loyalty, price versus specs actually does matter. Overall, I think the iPhone 15 is the best base iPhone the company has ever made. It's got the right refinements in the looks, it brings the 14 Pro features down in price, and then brings the camera features I'd expect from an iPhone at this price range. If you're in the market for the best iPhone for most people, I think that this is it, but stay tuned for my reviews on the other variants to discuss who those devices are for. Let me know if you agree with our assessment in the comments down below, and while you're at it, follow us on social media and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. You can also follow me on my personal handles to see me start with the smallest iPhone, but don't worry, we're gonna get to the others. Please give this video a thumbs up if you like what you saw. I'm Jaime Rivera, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.